Hi, my name is Amanda Campbell Crawford, and I'm the current chair for the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission. We want to welcome you to our fourth annual Heritage Gathering and ask that you celebrate with us in Michigan's Underground Railroad Month here in September. The Michigan Freedom Trail Commission was founded in 1998 with the intense mission, mission and purpose to promote, preserve, interpret, understand, and educate on Michigan's unique role in the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad is one of history's greatest examples of the pursuit of civil rights, a conversation that even 174 years later is still very relevant today. We ask that you ask questions, lean in, learn, and most of all, we hope that you share what you hear here today. If you have questions or comments or feedback for us, or you're interested in the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission, we hope that you reach out. Thanks for joining us. Hello. I'm Sandra Clark, Director of the Michigan History Center. And on behalf of our parent agency, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, I'm pleased to welcome you today to the fourth annual Underground Railroad Heritage Gathering. One of the silver linings of the past few months has been seeing the ability of virtual programming to reach more people and bring in different speakers from across the country. This year, our Freedom Trail Commission Conference Committee, Dr. Roy Finkenbein, Dr. Angela Dillard, and Dr. Jason Young have put together an exceptional program for all of us to examine Michigan's 1847 support of freedom seekers and the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. But our embracing of virtual programming does not mean that we have forgotten how valuable in-person sharing of knowledge and experiences is. So we hope that all of you who can will join us on October 2nd in Ann Arbor at the Clements Library to share even more about the work being done in Michigan today and to discover that wonderful library's collections. As always, special thanks to all of you who give your time and effort to tell Michigan's exceptional inspiring stories of resistance to slavery. Hello, I'm Paul Erickson, the director of the William L. Clements Library at the University of Michigan. On behalf of all of my colleagues here at the Clements, I want to say what an honor it is to help co-host the fourth annual Heritage Gathering of the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission. We're looking forward to seeing all of you here in Ann Arbor. The mission of the Clements Library is to collect, preserve, and share the printed and written record of America's diverse histories up to 1900. Our collections of rare books, prints, maps, and manuscripts have particular strengths in the history of exploration, the American Revolution, and 19th century reform, including abolitionism and the work of the Underground Railroad. Situated right at the heart of campus, the Clements is the finest collection of early Americana at a public university in the United States. And that public university part makes a big difference. Our collections exist to be used in teaching and research by students and faculty at the university, scholars around the country, and also by the people of Michigan. If this year's Heritage Gathering is your first visit to the Clements, welcome. We hope you come back again to explore the library's collections. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Michigan Freedom Trail Commission's virtual uh, gathering and uh, to our presentation tonight on the 1847 uh, Kentucky Raid and on uh, the liberation of John Felix White. Um, we're appreciative to have you here today and we're live. So um, we ask that you uh, kick back, relax, interact, uh, enjoy, and um, uh, do take a look at, we have uh, one more virtual event coming up. Um, that's next week. We hope that you uh, you uh, seek that out and join us for that. Um, during today's, or uh, during this evening's presentations, you're more than welcome and we encourage you to use the question and answer feature located at the bottom of your screen and also um, uh, the chat feature, which is located also at the bottom of your screen. We will answer questions at the end. So we have two presenters today, um, but uh, we'll save our questions until the end and then we'll have a, a nice uh, question and answer opportunity there um, at the end. Um, we hope that you look for the feedback sheet that you'll get in the uh, in your email, the email that you use to register for this session. Um, we really hope that you engage with this because this, this feedback gives us guidance for future conferences. 
We have a big thank you to the uh, National Park Service's Network to Freedom program. Um, they uh, have supported us financially for these uh, sessions and we really appreciate it. So my name is Amanda Campbell Crawford. I am your moderator or facilitator for this evening and I'm the current chair for the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission. I want to tell you just a little bit about our uh, two very dynamic presenters tonight, Dr. Vita Tucker and Mrs. Carol Mull. Um, Dr. Vita Tucker uh, will discuss the Kentucky raid in Cass County, um, and uh, she is a retired professor of English and African American Studies and uh, director of the Coochie Office of Local History at Grand Valley State University here in Michigan. She's also the author of The Kentucky Raid, A 21st Century History, and the uh, co-author of The Fluid Frontier. If you don't have a copy, I'd encourage you to run out and get one. And, um, oh, and yes, I'm, I need to say this, the, uh, the Fluid Frontier, it's the Fluid Frontier Slavery Resistance and the Underground Railroad in the Detroit River Borderland. So uh, Mrs. Carol Mall, she is um, a uh, researcher. She writes and lectures on the history of the Underground Railroad in the anti-slavery movement here in Michigan. She was a founding member and former chair of the Michigan Freedom Trail Commission. She's the author of the Underground Railroad in Michigan. Again, run out and get yourself a copy if you don't have one. Um, and uh, we're very excited to have her with us tonight. She is a scholar in residence of the African American Culture and uh, History Museum at uh, Washtenaw County. So uh, thank you ladies very much for joining us and we'll start with Dr. Tucker this evening. So take it away Vita. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you everyone who's here listening. I, on your screen, you should see the very first slide in my presentation. And the slide is an image that was created by a local artist in Cass County. And that particular uh, slide is a mural on a building downtown in Cass County. And the title of this particular uh, scene is Crossing the Ohio. Now, I wrote my little book, uh, the Kentucky Raid, a 21st century account in order to go along with the, the mural that was uh, painted in Cass County. And that book came out in 2010. But my research on the Underground Railroad in Cass County and particularly the um, 1847 Kentucky Raid began about 10 years before that, because I really didn't know very much about Cass County or the Kentucky Raid before then. But I went to a, historic, a conference in Battle Creek, perhaps in the year 2002, I don't remember the exact date. And at the conference, I met several people from Cass County and they told me stories about the Kentucky Raid. This is the beginning of what they told me. They said, prior to the raid on August 17, 1847, a man by the name of Carpenter went to the law office of Charles Stewart in Kalamazoo. Carpenter told Stewart that he was a, an abolitionist and he was interested in studying law. During the course of the conversation, Carpenter mentioned that he was also interested in learning about runaways in the area. So Stewart directed him to Cass County. Apparently it was not a secret that there was a strong Quaker abolitionist community helping runaways in Cass County. At some point, and this is how the story continued, Carpenter traveled the 50 miles to Cass County from Kalamazoo. In Cass, Carpenter was a stranger to everyone. So when people asked him who he was, he said he was a reporter for an abolitionist newspaper back in Massachusetts, and he wanted to know more about runaways in the county. 
Now, after they told me that story, I absolutely did not believe one word of it. I thought it was a very nice little legend or tale that they had come across. And so that pushed me into an eight year quest to find out what really happened. I was surprised to learn that there really was a person who called himself Carpenter, who came to West Michigan prior to the August raid. This mysterious Carpenter gathered crucial intelligence that he must have delivered to the enslavers back in Kentucky. Last week, in the program, the Heritage Gathering program, Professor Marty uh, gave me the information that there really was a carpenter. But of course, in 2002 and 2004, I thought this was a fairy tale. Later on, my research also revealed that as early as 1841, enslavers in Kenton County, Kentucky, had formed an organization for the purpose of recapturing runaways from several counties in Kentucky. So I asked myself, was it possible that this mysterious carpenter had been hired by that group of Kentucky enslavers to find out where in Michigan fugitives from their farm might be? This possible connection uh, made the Carpenter story a little bit more credible, but I still wasn't convinced. Later in my research, I found the names of the Kentuckians who raided Cass County. They were listed in local and district court records and in historical accounts of the raid. At least five Kentucky enslavers were named. G.W. Brasher, Milton and John Graves, Charles Scott, and Thornton Timberlake. Eight more Kentucky men were part of the large party that showed up in Cass County before dawn on the morning of August 7, 1847. There were several local histories that explained what happened during the raid and leading up to the raid. And this is what I found. Some days before the actual raid, the five enslavers along with about eight other Kentuckians arrived in Battle Creek, Michigan, which was about 70 miles from Cass County. As that large party rolled into Battle Creek in multiple wagons, they immediately attracted attention. When they checked into a local hotel, they were asked what brought them to Battle Creek. The Kentuckians claimed that they were traveling salesmen selling household machinery to farmers. The reason that they gave for their visit must not have satisfied someone at the hotel so he went to inform Erastus Hussey, the Battle Creek Underground Railroad agent. And may I, may I show the next slide, please? This is Erastus Hussey. Erastus Hussey came to the hotel where the Kentuckians had checked in and he got right to the point. He told the Kentuckians that their lives would be in danger if they tried to kidnap Negroes in the neighborhood. Then Hussey went home and wrote a letter to Zachariah Sugar. Next slide, please. Zachariah Sugar was the Underground Railroad agent in Cass. Hussey's letter warned Sugar that there were slave catchers about. After writing his letter, Hussey had to find someone who could mount up and make the 70 mile trip to Cass to deliver that message. But it seems the Kentuckians left town before the messenger left because they arrived in Cass County in the early morning before dawn and they struck 
before Hussey's messenger arrived. Now I wanna say a, a little bit about Zachariah Sugart. He lived in um, Penn Township. No, he lived in Calhoun Township in Cass County and he owned a dry goods store. He kept a log book of accounts and other things in his, uh, that were going on business that he conducted in his store. And so what you see next to his photograph is the first page of his day book. And in this day book, he not only recorded accounts, but he also recorded the names of runaway freedom seekers. Now, it's important to take a look at the date of the first page of this book. It says day book, 10th month, fourth day, 1838. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is another page from Zachariah Shivert's account book and is very clear. At the top, you will see it categorizes runaway Negroes. And he has the date listed. And his handwriting is not always legible. His fours and fives look alike. But that date in the, on, on the side is 1841. And he's listing all of these people who have come to Cass County on the Underground Railroad, they're runaways. So these are the documents that we were able to use. Now, when I was doing my initial research, all we had was a photograph, a photocopy pages from Zachariah Sugar's account book. We did not have the entire document. We know now that as of 2018, the Huntington Library was able to acquire the original document. We didn't know in 2005 or 2006 that the original was even available. So now you can actually go online and look at, um, what is it? digitized copies of this book. Next slide, please. Um, I want to say a little bit about um, the person who actually helped Zachariah Sugar as the conductor in Cass County. His name was Henry Shepard. And Henry Shepard was an African American. Henry Shepard, along with Zachariah Sugar, actually uh, uh, received fugitives and they actually conducted them out of Cass County when they wanted to leave to the next um, Underground Railroad station in Schoolcraft. Um, there are no photos of Henry Shepard. This is quite common for African-Americans it's very difficult to find uh, photos. But I first found Henry Shepard's name when I was reading the papers of Dr. Nathan Thomas, who was the Underground Railroad contact in Schoolcraft, which was the next stop after Cass County. His papers are at the Bentley Historical Library in Ann Arbor. And in those papers, Dr. Thomas wrote, the colored man who came with him, Zachariah Sugar is Henry Shepard. So that was the first time that I was able to ascertain that this was actually an African-American. We also found out more about Henry Shepard in his obituary that was written in the local newspaper 
the Cassopolis Vigilant in July of 1884. And I just want to read to you a small segment of that obituary because it really gives us a picture of who Henry Shepherd was. This uh, obituary is titled, Death of an Old Citizen. Another old landmark and pioneer has passed away. Henry Shepherd has been called from labor to reward. The deceased was born in Virginia, August 20th, 1817, and was taken to Kentucky when quite young and remained there in slavery until he was about 20 years old. Then he took his flight for the North, but was captured on the banks of the Ohio River and was there put in jail. While in jail, his feet were frozen to his knees. He was taken back to his old master in Kentucky, where he remained for about one year until his feet got so that he could travel. He was bound that his posterity should not be enslaved. Freedom he was bound to have. So he again took his flight, taking the North Star for his guide. This time after many privations and hardships, he succeeded in gaining his freedom. Coming to Cass County, where he remained only long enough to earn money to take him to Canada. But not being satisfied with the country, Canada, he returned to Cass County where he married Martha Barton. They were married 44 years, the 20th day of last June, which would have been June, 1883. He enlisted in 64, 1864, and went to the army where he served nearly two years, then returning to his home in Vandalia. Later, I was able to locate his enlistment papers with the US colored troops in Washington, DC. And he really did, his, his enlistment paper said that he was born in Virginia and he enlisted in, in 64. So now we're back at August, 1847. Well, the Kentuckians wasted no time going to any wrong addresses in Cass County. They knew exactly where to go in the county in order to surprise the fugitives. But if this was their first time in the county, how could they have known where to go? The Raiders' accurate knowledge of the area gave me another reason to believe the Carpenter story. Someone, very likely the mysterious Carpenter, had provided the Kentuckians the locations where the runaways could be found. Can I have the next slide, please? On this slide, you can see that Cass County has 16 townships, but the Kentuckians only went to three. They knew exactly where they were going. How did they know? Did the mysterious carpenter really exist? When they got to Penn Township, Calvin Township, and Porter Township, they split up into small groups. One group went to Josiah Osborne's farm in Porter Township, where three African-American men were captured, but a woman and her daughter got away. At another farm, most likely Henry Shepherd's in Calvin Township, the Kentuckians broke down the cabin door and wounded an African-American man known as William Merriman to the Quakers, but he was called Lewis by the Kentuckians. Merriman or Lewis 
fought the Raiders by swinging a three-legged stool, but the Raiders fought back, injuring Merriman, but finally they subdued and shackled him. At another farm, most likely the East Farm in Porter Township, the Raiders tried to seize a man, his wife, and their infant. While the Raiders cornered the man, the woman jumped out of the window, leaving her baby. One of the Raiders picked up the baby, and when the mother heard her baby cry, she returned and she was captured. At another farm, the Raiders captured a man, but his wife escaped. At the farm of Stephen Bogue in Penn Township, we know exactly what happened because one of the African-Americans in a cabin that morning gave his eyewitness account of what happened in an interview that he gave to a local newspaper many years later. His name was Perry Sanford. May I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> this is what Perry Sanford said. I was in one of Stephen Bogue's log cabins. Rube Stevens and I slept up in a garret. About four o'clock, there came a knock at the door. Sanford inquired, who's there? A friend came the reply. We all recognized the voice of Jack Graves, the master of Sanford and the brother of my master. He said, open the door, Joe. But Joe did not open the door. He commenced to yell murder in order to arouse Stephen Bowe. The slave masters then smashed in the window and thrust a double barrel shotgun in. We all kept heavy hickory clubs in the cabin and Sanford grabbed his club and struck at them through the window. They thought it was a gun and ran, leaving their shotgun in the window. We were so frightened that we never grabbed that gun, but left it there for them to recover as they soon returned. Sanford attempted to run, but was captured, as was his wife and daughter. Rube Stevens ran out and succeeded in escaping. I crawled out of the roof, then jumped to the ground. I alarmed Stephen Bold, and he mounted his horse and ran him to Cassopolis to alarm people there. Mrs. Bogue secreted me upstairs in their house. Next slide, please. <clears throat> These are the Bogues and Perry Sanford, Rube Stevens and Joe Sanford and his wife and daughter were staying in a cabin on the Bogue farm in Penn Township. After the Kentuckians had rounded up as many people as they could, they planned to rendezvous at the town mill, then make a very quick exit out of town with the people that they had captured. But when they got to the mill, they were surprised. There was a large crowd of angry people, both whites and blacks, and most of them were brandishing fence stakes, clubs, and other weapons. The Kentuckians had guns, of course, but they knew that they were outnumbered and they would eventually be overrun by the crowd. Josiah Osborne stepped out of the crowd to speak. He argued that the Raiders should go to the courthouse in Cassopolis and give the captives a fair trial. Since the Raiders could see that to get away, they would have to shoot a lot of people and they still might be overpowered. They agreed to go back to town and show proof of their ownership of the people that they had captured. What the Kentuckians expected to be an open and shut case turned out to be a frustrating series of legal procedures with charges filed against the Raiders themselves. A temporary magistrate 
was presiding in court that morning. His name was Ebenezer McIlvain. McIlvain was also an Underground Railroad agent in the nearby town of Niles. Before hearing the Kentuckians complaints, the African Americans brought charges against the Kentuckians. This probably was an amazing reversal to the Kentuckians because they had never seen or heard of African Americans appearing in court to file charges against whites. At that time in America, African Americans could not file charges against whites, nor could they testify against whites for any type of offense. But in Cass County, these African Americans were granted these legal rights. While Lewis, alias Merriman, had been badly beaten and bloodied, he charged several raiders with assault. Henry Shepard, Cass County's African-American Underground Railroad conductor, charged some of the Kentuckians with breaking into his home. Other African-Americans charged the Kentuckians with kidnapping. As it turned out, to keep themselves from being arrested and taken to the local jail, the Kentuckians had to post bail and find a local attorney who would present their case in court when court reconvened. Over the next day or two, the nine captured African-Americans and 34 uncaptured African-Americans were escorted out of Cass and taken to the next stop on the Underground Railroad, uh, Nathan Mason, Macy Thomas's home in Schoolcraft. Next slide, please. This is Nathan Mason, Macy Thomas. In a memoir that was published in 1892 by Thomas's wife, Pamela, she described the night that a large group of Negroes were brought to her home by Zachariah Sugar and other guards. This is what she said. <clears throat> when the group arrived at her home, she needed additional staples and ingredients to feed so many. So she borrowed extra staples and ingredients from neighbors. After they were all fed, the group continued on their way, much to my relief, because I had no idea where they would all sleep and what they would eat the next morning. The next stop after the school craft station was back in Battle Creek at the front door again of Erastus Hussey. This is the way Hussey described the scene of the group's arrival. Uh, and he, he gave this interview to the Sunday morning call newspaper in Battle Creek in 1855. He said, everybody had heard of their coming and every man, woman and child were out upon the street. And it looked as if a circus was coming to town. It was a lovely moonlight night. There were nine white men with them who acted as guards. Ahead of them rode Zach Sugar with his broad brimmed white Quaker hat and mounted upon a fine horse. He always had good horses. He met me in front of my house and shook hands with me. The nine white men stopped at the hotel and the people cared for their horses. The fugitives had a jolly good time that night. The next morning, about half of them went on to Canada and others followed afterwards, unquote. Hussey also said that Mrs. Hussey was sick in bed, so he did not know exactly what to do with such a large group, but he found an unoccupied building, rented it for the night, collected 60 pounds of flour, 
some potatoes and pork and let the fugitives cook their own meal. Meanwhile, back in court in Cass County on Monday, there was no need to continue prosecuting the Raiders because the captives that they wanted were well on their way to Canada. So all charges against the Raiders were dropped and the Kentuckians were free to go, but they left as they came without the human property they had come so close to recapturing. Feeling that they had been cheated and insulted, the Kentuckians were probably fuming. Their next plan of action was probably decided on the way back to Kentucky. They decided that they would raise their voices in grievance meetings in their local communities and write letters to, news, to the newspapers. They would send petitions to the state legislature. They would contact state and national congressmen and demand better laws to help slave owners recover runaways. Last week, Professor Marty in this program outlined the enslavers complaints and how they arrived finally in Congress and resulted in a new fugitive slave law. But the Kentuckians also decided that they would make sure that everyone in Cass County who had prevented them from capturing their human property was, was prosecuted. So in January of 1849, in the US Seventh Circuit Court in the Eastern District of Michigan, several of the Kentucky enslavers filed formal complaints against Cass County abolitionists seeking restitution for their lost property. May I have the next slide, please? This is uh, a photocopy of one of the affidavits that was filed by Milton Graves in January of 1849 against Stephen Bogue. And as you can see, if you can read through, I don't know if you can see my pointer. There's Stephen Bogue, the complaint is against Stephen Bogue. And it says that uh, he harbored one person whom the plaintiff lawfully held to labor, commonly called an African slave, namely Perry. So this is an affidavit that was filed to try to get some restitution for the loss of Perry. And you did see that photograph of Perry Sanford. By the time I found the handwritten trial transcripts, so many circumstances supporting the Carpenter story made me willing to accept the story as true, but I still had not found the unambiguous evidence that I was hoping to find at the start of my quest. But one day while sitting in the Burden Historical Library research room in Detroit, reading the handwritten pages of witness testimony transcribed during the 1850 trial. There it was, the evidence that I had been searching for for almost 10 years. The Quaker James East in his testimony said that on the morning of the raid, he recognized Graves and Carpenter because both of them had visited Cass before the raid. East also testified that Graves and Carpenter had come to his house in Porter Township and that Graves had discussed buying cattle, but he had also asked about runaways in the neighborhood. East testified that he told Graves and Carpenter that he supposed 
that there were runaways in the neighborhood. When I read that testimony, I wanted to jump up and scream, but because I was in the quietest room in the library, I had to compose myself because no one in the research room would care what I had found or understand why I was screaming. So I came back to my senses and continued reading the trial records. I was pleased to find that the lawsuit ended with a hung jury. So nobody won, but I was disappointed to learn that the draconian 1850 fugitive slave law was passed while the trial was underway. Encouraged by the new law, the Kentuckians would initiate another lawsuit and the penalties for violating the new 1850 fugitive slave law could mean imprisonment and or bankruptcy for the Cass Quakers. So the next case was settled out of court with heavy fines and court costs to be paid by the Quakers. Some of the Quakers, Quaker defendants asked to settle the case, but other defendants called the settlement blood money. Nevertheless, the case was settled and all defendants were forced to pay court costs. In 1851, Josiah Osborne wrote an open letter to his neighbors in Cass solicit soliciting donations. And this is the text of his letter. Our trial has been had at great expense and the jury were unable to agree upon a verdict. The cost of witnesses taken to Detroit amounted to near $1,600. Other expenses of the lawyers amount to $2,200, all of which we have to pay. All know it and can see our situation as the defendants of justice, the laws of God and the laws of God. We appeal to all and ask them to contribute their might and save us from ruin. And that is where I will stop with my information about the Kentucky raid. And certainly if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we'll talk about them later. Dr. Tucker, thank you. That's, um, I, I, when you were uh, talking about wanting to jump up and down in the burden reading room, I was, I was right there with you, <laughs> that excitement, so. You felt um, that before, right? I did. I did. I did. What, what a what an amazing story. So thank you um, for sharing that. And, uh, and that's a feeling that I know that um, uh, Carol Mall has definitely felt also. So um, without further delay, uh, Carol, you want to take it away? And just a, a quick reminder, sorry uh, to interrupt, Carol, just a quick reminder, everybody down at the bottom of your screen, there's uh, two ways that you can post questions. One is the Q&A icon, just tap on that, type your question in there, or there is the chat button also. And I see that we have a few uh, questions and comments in the chat. Thank you for folks that have put those in there and um, we'll get to those at the end. So take it away, Carol. Well, thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Amanda. And thanks to everyone at the Michigan History Center and the Freedom Trail Commission for organizing this gathering. Also, thank you to the National Park Service Network to Freedom for their support. Tonight, I will share the story of John Felix White. I should just mention that I started researching him, oh, I hate to date myself here and age myself, but maybe 15 years ago when I was doing work for my book. But I did a deep dive into his story three or four years ago when I decided to try to nominate the site of his abduction to the National Park Service Network to Freedom Listing. So that's when I discovered all sorts of resources that gave me a very complete picture beyond the early sources of Levi Coffin and um, Laura Havlin's autobiographies. 
So here we go. The first part of my presentation will look at White's early life, his escape, and several years on free soil. Next, I will share a detailed accounting of the plot to kidnap him. Finally, we will learn the fates of White, his family, and his enemies. There were many common elements in the attacks of 1847, as you just heard from Vita, spies, deceit, use of deadly force, but each event also had unique characteristics. After the previous unsuccessful attempts to recapture so-called fugitives from service in Michigan, what did five slaveholders hope to gain by capturing John White in the fall of 1847? They spent more money than they could ever recoup. White was now a known runaway and of diminished value on the slave market. The slaveholders might have been jailed. Was this a final test in Michigan of the existing fugitive slave law? Let's begin. Next slide. I hope you can see that whole map. Okay. We know very little of John White's early life. He was born into slavery in Virginia from the age of two held in bondage in Northern Kentucky. He was known as Felix during his 25 years in chattel slavery. We have only his words from a single interview in which he described being whipped up rather than raised up. Though White endured the punishing conditions of slavery, he experienced intervals of happiness. He formed an attachment with Jane Stevens, daughter of Benjamin Stevens, her legal possessor. Yes, and the man who was her father. Jane was enslaved in Rabbit Hash, Boone County, as you see circled, a rural area in the floodplains of the Ohio River opposite Rising Sun, Indiana. John White was able to visit her and the children they bore. Next slide. It was the fate of the bonded to face sudden horrific changes. Without warning, White was sold to George Washington Brasher. Ah, you just heard that name. Also known as Brazier and Brashier. Brasher was a wealthy merchant, landowner, member of the Kentucky legislature, and a cruel trader in human flesh who profited from buying and selling men, women, and children. White expected to be carried to the Southern slave market. Everything he knew and loved lay in Northern Kentucky. He was without resources to bargain for himself or his family's freedom. White concluded that the only hope of reuniting with his family was to run away and later rescue them. Next slide. And so his escape began. In the mid 1840s, Felix White crossed the Ohio River from Boone County, Kentucky to Rising Sun, Indiana. There he found refuge with African-American friends, the Barkshires and the Edgertons. Samuel Barkshire was formerly enslaved in Kentucky, owned property on both sides of the river and offered shelter as needed. The search for White was so intense, it proved impossible to keep him hidden in Rising Sun for long. Though slavery was illegal in the Great Lakes states, abductions were a constant threat to all African-Americans, whether free or unfree. White was directed north to Newport, Indiana, and the home of Quakers Levi and Catherine Coffin. Next slide. The Coffins had been in the business of helping self-emancipators for over a decade. They were part of integrated interstate networks. White was among 2,000 self-free people aided by the Coffins in Newport before they moved on to Cincinnati in 1847. Coffin's stature in the community ensured that local officials would not meddle in his affairs. African-Americans in Newport endured forced searches and seizures. And they could inform Coffin when slave hunters menaced the neighborhood. The Coffins protected White several weeks and finally convinced him to continue on to Canada. He would not be legally extradited back to the United States from there. The Coffins directed White to stop over at the home of Laura Smith Haviland near Adrian, Michigan. 
I don't know if it's clear enough that you can see, but this is a Habs drawing that was done um, in the early 1900s of the house as it is. And there, there's a secret hiding room uh, space there on the second floor, but also the basement was built intentionally to have freedom seekers hidden there with an indoor well. Very interesting if you wanna look up the historic American building surveys online. Next slide. White journeyed on free soil from Northern Indiana into Southern Michigan, always under threat of capture by unscrupulous slave and bounty hunters. As you learned in previous presentations, some slaveholders formed associations to track down and recapture runaways to counter underground railroad activism north of the Ohio River. It could have taken several weeks to walk from Newport, Indiana to Adrian, Michigan. There is no record of White's mode or path of travel. The paths of escape were well-worn to Fort Wayne, Indiana, also east into Ohio, northeast to the Detroit River borderlands, or northwest to the Cass County settlements you just heard about. Whatever way he went, White found his way to the farm of Laura Haviland in Raisin Township, Lenaway County. Haviland was a key figure in transnational networks of escape, linking the Great Lakes states and Canada. She provided leaseholds and assistance to self-freed men and women. White continued on to Ontario, Canada, but within a short time, returned to Haviland's home in Southeast Michigan. Unable to travel during the winter, White attended the Haviland Institute, as you see pictured here. It was a school for students of all races and gender. He would get the education denied him in bondage. And from this point, he identified himself as John F. White. Next slide. When the weather improved, John White embarked on a return trek of nearly 300 miles to the Coffins, Indiana home. After several months, he continued on to Cincinnati, determined to liberate his family. He fruitlessly traveled the banks of the Ohio River for months, searching and begging for a boat and assistance. There was no help to be found. Defeated, White returned to Michigan. He stayed on the Haviland farm and once again attended school. After some time, in order to earn money to rescue his family, White left the Haviland Institute to work on the farm of Royal and Sally Watkins in 1847. Next slide. And here begins the plot to abduct John Felix White. We just heard about the Kentucky raid. The kidnapping on Michigan soil was well publicized throughout Michigan but not the names of all the offenders. George Washington Brasher was among those stealing African-Americans in the Kentucky raid. In Southeast Michigan, citizens had been on the alert after the attack of the Crosswright family in January of that year. Laura Haviland was especially uneasy after recently being threatened by Thomas and John P. Chester of Tennessee. In December of 1846, the Chesters tried to kidnap Willis and Elsie Hamilton from her property. The Southerners held her at gunpoint when she obstructed them in Toledo, Ohio. So when a stranger appeared at the Haviland Institute in the fall of 1847, Laura Haviland was justly suspicious. Next slide. The stranger introduced himself as a teacher from Ohio, an associate and an associate of the Underground Railroad. He was neither. He was a lawyer from Kentucky who accompanied slave trader Brasher on a mission to repossess the young man enslaved as Felix White. The deceitful lawyer, J.L. Smith, lingered on Haviland's property until around 4 p.m. Haviland knew he was an imposter, but she did not know who he was seeking. The Hamiltons were living in Canada. She will soon learn that five Southern slave enslavers were headquartered 30 miles distant in Toledo, Ohio. You can see that down in the right-hand corner of this map. Thomas Chester, the man who tried to take the Hamiltons and aimed a gun at Haviland, was among them. 
also G.W. Brasher of Kentucky. The men may have been members of the associations that were organized to recover fugitives, such as the Association for Securing Our Servants. Next slide. The following day, Haviland realized John White, her former student, was in danger. White had been working and living for some time on the farm of Royal and Sally Watkins, about an hour's ride north of the Haviland Institute. Haviland sent a student on horseback to Eastern Jackson County to warn White. Royal Watkins, a covenanter, was fervently opposed to slavery. Watkins hired African and Native Americans as laborers, including members of the Okro family. Nelson Okro would play a part in the attempt to kidnap John White. Next slide. Two days after arriving in the area, Brasher and his cohorts met in a nearby saloon. Brasher announced an offer of $75 for information about White's exact whereabouts. That was an exorbitant amount of money when a laborer earned less than a dollar a day. Brasher hired two local men to round out his posse. Local men overheard the slaveholders' plan to capture John White. Brasher hired a carriage to take his posse at full speed from Manchester to the Watkins farm. Unfortunately for Brasher, the carriage driver was an abolitionist who chose a long scenic route into neighboring Washtenaw County. Meanwhile, Nelson Okro, a member of this local black family I just mentioned that worked for Royal Watkins, borrowed a fast horse to arrive first to give warning. Next slide. The Watkins farm straddled the counties of Jackson and Washtenaw counties, of Washtenaw County, about five miles north of Lenaway County. Upon arrival, Brasher brazenly trespassed across the rolling hills, surveying hundreds of acres under cultivation. His men spied a lone man in a distant field wearing a broad brimmed hat. Brasher organized the posse to surround the man. The seven armed abductors spaced themselves equally around the field and steadily advanced from all sides. They closed in, weapons drawn, leaving no path of escape. In one move, the men grabbed their quarry, threw off his hat and discovered a poor white man. Next slide. Brasher was outraged. He marched to the house and angrily confronted Royal Watkins, demanding to know where he might find John White. Watkins replied, quote, I suppose he is in Canada as I took him with his trunk to the depot yesterday for that country, unquote. Brasher swore Laura Haviland was responsible for the entire ruse, but Watkins replied, quote, hold on, sir. You are laboring under a mistake. We have none of us seen her. And I want you to understand that there are others, myself included, who are ready to do as much to save a self-freed slave from being taken back to Southern bondage as Mrs. Haviland. Mr. White is highly esteemed wherever he is known. And we would not see him go back from whence he came without making great effort to prevent it." Unquote. Next slide. The following day, Brasher and his men met at the Snell Hotel Tavern in nearby Tecumseh. Witnesses described pistols, bowie knives, and other weapons laid out on the table. Brasher swore terrible threats against Laura Haviland, shocking behavior towards a widow and a mother. Friends of John White throughout the area waited anxiously, fearing vengeance for having outwitted Brasher. Finally, late in the afternoon, the slaveholders left for Toledo, Ohio, where they boarded a train to take them home. Next slide. This should be the end of the story, but it is not. John White longed to reunite with his wife and five children after several years apart. He returned to Laura Haviland's farm and convinced her to bring his family out of Boone County. 
Haviland traveled to Cincinnati to confer with the coffins. Her friends tried to dissuade her from undertaking a life-threatening rescue. George Brasher had filed a federal warrant for her arrest. If she were caught, Laura Haviland would likely join slave rescuer Reverend Calvin Fairbank in the Kentucky State Penitentiary, or worse, Despite the warnings, Haviland crossed into Kentucky and inveigled her way to meet Jane Stevens. At the time, two of Jane's children were hired out to another farmer and she would not leave without all of her children. White's family remained in bondage awaiting his rescue. In the fall of 1848, White communicated with Jan, Jane his plan to free them. Jane, their five children, and bondsman Solomon made their way to the Ohio River. Suddenly, Stephen's posse was upon them. John White watched in horror as his family was chased down. He heard the screams of Jane and the children, Oscar, George, Emily Francis, Cicely, and Lucy Ann, as they were carried back into bondage. John White hid in the woods on the northern shore of the Ohio for two weeks, distraught and afraid. As he began the trek north, notorious slave catcher Wright Ray of Madison, Indiana, discovered and arrested White. Next slide. White gave Ray the false name of Armstrong, likely a self freed man he met in Canada. When Armstrong's former Enslaver declined to pay the expenses for his return, White said his friends would purchase his freedom. He wrote to Laura Haviland by way of Royal Watkins' son. Haviland and the Coffins did not dare travel to Kentucky, but they managed to pay White's ransom. According to Levi Coffin, quote, John returned to Michigan almost brokenhearted. All his endeavors to gain the freedom of his wife and children had been in vain, unquote. Next slide. Frederick Douglass posted a request for donations to defray the cost to purchase White's freedom in his newspaper, The North Star, on January 12, 1849. This was followed by a notice in another paper in the next issue that Garrett Smith had contributed to the cause. Next slide. And now we reach the final part of this presentation. John White remained in Sandwich, Ontario, Canada West. His name appears among those attending an anti-slavery meeting led by Henry Bibb. Bibb fled Kentucky a decade before White. He also returned to rescue his wife and was caught. It is possible John White met Bibb in Adrian when Bibb spoke while on the Michigan anti-slavery lecture circuit in the mid 1840s. Bibb later moved to Canada and encouraged all African Americans to join him there. Another person attending Bibb's meeting was Mary Jane Reynolds. She would be married to Bibb, excuse me, she would be married to White in Detroit by a Baptist minister recorded on December 8, 1852. The couple's first children were born in Sandwich where White farmed a 50 acre property for about a decade. Around 1858, while White, White remained legally enslaved, the family moved back to the United States to the Farmington, Michigan area. The Whites would raise six children. Next slide. White later located to Ann Arbor to the same street where Reverend Guy Beckley offered sanctuary to self-emancipators. In 1880, White and his eldest son worked as laborers while the four younger children were at school. Laura Havlin wrote that White sought the best education for his children. The Ann Arbor Fifth Ward School was fully integrated. John White lived to his mid eighties and died in 1905. He is buried in Ann Arbor within blocks of his last home. Meanwhile, Jane attempted to escape 
several more times. Haviland, Laura Haviland wrote that Jane died, but she was misinformed. Jane's owner and father separated Jane from her children and sold them all. After the Civil War, Jane Stevens married and reunited with all but one of her children. Some of White's Canadian children met their Kentucky siblings and lived near them in Boulder, Colorado. Descendant Jacqueline Chambers Martin is researching her ancestors, including her great-great-grandfather, John Felix White. Hillary Delaney and the researchers at the Boone County Public Library have amassed a trove of documents online related to Jane Stevens and her family. In 1849, G.W. Brasher accompanied his human cargo to New Orleans during a cholera, cholera outbreak. He caught the disease and died. After the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, Thomas Chester attempted to kidnap a free family in Ypsilanti, Michigan, claiming they were the Hamiltons. Chester's father wanted to avenge Laura Haviland. Chester secured a warrant from Judge Wilkins, who was involved in the Cromwell case. The judge called George de Baptiste to alert the local Underground Railroad activists. The Hamiltons produced their free paper and Chester was escorted to the depot. Around 1860, Thomas Chester's father, John P. Chester, challenged a man to produce his free papers, was shot and killed. Next slide. A large portion of the Watkins farm was purchased cooperatively by the state of Michigan and Washtenaw County. Both the Watkins Lake State Park and County Preserve and John White's burial place in Fairview Cemetery in Ann Arbor were accepted into the National Park Service Network to Freedom program in 2019. In conclusion, there is much to learn through the story of John White. White was never a passive participant. He used every avenue to improve his chances of saving his family, education, work, and reputation. He was esteemed by those who knew him. Citizens in three Michigan counties prevented his recapture. So what motivated Brasher to kidnap John Felix White in 1847? There are several possibilities that we can discuss during the chat. Perhaps it was to expose the vulnerability of border states and border state slaveholders and their severe economic losses from runaways, and also to gain support from pro-slavery Southerners. Perhaps it was simply revenge. John P. Chester of Tennessee was publicly humiliated by Laura Haviland and swore vengeance. Brasher very likely needed to prove he could keep a self-emancipator in his crosshairs forever. And he had failed to recover anyone in the Kentucky raid. The attacks of 1847 called attention to state and national conflicts over slavery. I look forward to hearing how these Michigan kidnapping attempts shape the future in the presentation next week. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, oh my gosh, I just, I wanna acknowledge that uh, this is some of these um, stories that we're hearing, I, this is like a, an emotional roller coaster, know. you know? I mean, these, there's a, there's a, some of this stuff just seems so um, salacious and, oh. and uh, it's, it's like it's ripped right out of a, a 19th century. <laughs> I know. Yeah, novel. novel. That, that, uh, it's, I didn't believe some it. Of it. Yeah, it seems um, believable. Uh, it seems unbelievable, and I've I feel just being here uh, with you ladies this evening. I've I've done this right for the entire uh, the entire time. So, oh mm -hmm. wow! Thanks for thanks for sharing those stories. Um, and and the fact that they're real, right? The the fact that they're facts oh. uh, is just yeah. absolutely uh, riveting. So. 
Uh, we have a couple questions in the uh, in the chat, and we also have a question in the uh, the Q and A. So again, just a reminder to people that um, feel free to continue to post questions in there, and um, we'll uh, we'll we'll answer them and discuss them um, or comments. Comments are welcome too. So. Um, the first one that uh, that we have, Vita, I, I believe is directed to you. So the Shepherd Farm in Calvin Township um, is is the is the Shepherd Farm in Calvin Township. Do you know if that's the Henry Shepherd? You know, associated directly with with Henry Shepherd um, from Cass County. And I have to give a shout out to Maurice Saunders for asking that question. A, a Cass County native and um, uh, someone. Hi, that's Maurice. Really How are you? <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. Um, I don't know if if the Shepherd Farm um, today is the same one, but I know it was in Van Vandalia in Calvin Township. Okay. He um, went to live in Covert at the end of his life with his uh, daughter, one of 15 children. Uh, so he ended his life in covert. So I don't know about that particular farm. That's something that maybe we could delve into together to see, because it would be phenomenal if some of it was still, you know, preserved. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, just a heads up, I want to apologize in advance. Um, my service is a little wonky this evening. So if I lose you or I come across choppy, um, uh, we have a uh, Sherry Giffen waiting in the wings and Toby Boyd to take over. So um, so yeah, I would uh, I would love to know um, the where's about right of, uh, of Henry Shepherd. And do you know where uh, Henry is buried, Vita? No, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I'm sure that's researchable and findable, you know, because someone gave a very detailed account of his life story in that uh, Cassopolis newspaper. I'm, I'm assuming it might have been his daughter who gave that story, or his wife might have still been alive at that time, too. So... Yeah, we, we could find out where he's buried. Great. All right, and a reminder from uh, Kathy Lapointe, another one of our uh, our Cass County folks, that uh, Dr. Tucker's book is available on Amazon. Make sure you get the second edition, the 2014. Um, so go out and check that out. So, um, and there's a, a quite a few kudos um, to both of you ladies in our chat, uh, just about the uh, the storytelling and the sharing of this. Uh, these this, these awesome stories, this awesome history. A reminder that the Nathan Thomas House um, was built in 1835, and it's located right there in Schoolcraft. Uh, tours are still available by appointment. Um, that uh, that place never. Um, I feel like I learned something new every time I go there. So, I encourage um, folks to check that out. Um, I just, just want to jump in and here. say that. I know that's yeah. open, but also the the Watkins Farm is now a, a park and um, it's going to be developed. I can't wait to see what is going to happen in the future. I mean, it's possible that in addition to all of the bird watching and I mean, it's just the most beautiful site. Um, in addition to all of that, that they will develop this underground railroad story that's so rich and, and have interpretation for that. I'm expecting that that's what's going to happen. And I look forward to seeing that happen. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we have a, a couple of comments in here about um, uh, just, just a lot of, of uh, pride folks from Battle Creek and um, the names that I'm recognizing from um, Cass County. I love this, uh, this, 
this uh, local connection. So I really appreciate everybody that has tuned in. And it sounds like folks are um, feeling the same vibes, um, just this this kind of excitement. And I feel like I've been on a roller coaster. So, um, <laughs> so one of the questions, um, Vita, to you is uh, a story circulated for years that one of the Raiders wagons was pushed into Birch Lake in uh, Porter Township, um, where it still remains to this day. Do you think that there's yeah, any that, truth that, to this? That's another one of the unsolvable mysteries of the Kentucky Raid. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone has tried to, um, you know, salvage that. It's just to dredge the, was it Diamond Lake? Or one of the, I think it was Diamond Lake. I, guess Diamond. Or, I think, I or thought it was, it? yeah. Diamond or Birch, the the oh um, okay, Birch the, Lake could could have been, but no one seems to ever have um, gotten it up off the bottom of the of the lake. Um, you know, there are certain aspects of the story that we just cannot um, verify. Like, you know that Carpenter left Kalamazoo. And he ended up in Cass. He did he drive a wagon or did he ride a horse? We don't know. When the Kentuckians arrived in Battle Creek, they had several wagons because they brought enough transportation to actually take the people who had escaped back with them. So they had empty wagons. So it's quite possible that they you know, someone did destroy one of the wagons. There was a large crowd early that morning and um, the Kentuckians followed the crowd back to Cassopolis. We don't, we can't say for sure that they got all of their wagons <laughs> back. Interesting question, you know, some, Historical questions just aren't answerable. <laughs> yeah. Unless you find that, like... that one piece of evidence, which is, you know, like finding a needle in a haystack. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, just a little reminder in the chat here um, uh, that. Uh, uh, you can um, view, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Tucker mentioned Dr. Marty's presentation from last week, um, and the Vimeo account is there in the chat. Uh, if you weren't able to tune in with us last week, um, please feel free to, to uh, take a look at that. Um, and then just a, a clarification or a little more information if you have it, Carol, on the Watkins House in Manchester. Can folks visit it? Or so the, the grounds are a state park. Did I understand that? Um, is that yes, it is. It's opened up now as a hiking trail, so that sort of thing. At some point, I believe they might be looking for a state pass to do it. But right now, I mean, I go there all the time and hike because it's just so beautiful. And they, they have incredible bird watching opportunities there. Um, and um, I, it's just, it's beautiful. So I, I don't know what the plans in the future are going to be, but right now it is accessible to the public. So. There's a, there's a comment in the chat box about the shepherd farm in Vandalia. And Kathy LaPointe wrote this, and Kathy knows because she lives right there in Cass. She says the site of the Shepherd Farm is next to the Vandalia Cemetery. There is nothing there now. All buildings were torn down. But the site apparently is known by locals. So I don't know, I have to ask Day. Johnson, if the site could be nominated since we know what it was, it even could. though there's nothing there. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> In theory, and I, and I believe Day, um, Day is... <laughs> I believe Day is here with us this evening, so. <laughs> she will encourage you. I, I definitely know she will encourage you. Did you hear that, Day? <laughs> uh, 
So ladies, you've both done some just uh, amazing scholarly detailed um, research here. Where um, were the were the places where you were there places where you were surprised to find information about these stories? Yes, well, I definitely. Um, yeah. You know, you go to the library and you're looking for one thing, and something else pops up. And so I was reading Nathan Thomas's papers just to find out more about him. And I saw this sentence that he wrote that said, Henry Shepherd is the colored man who came with Zach Sugar. I wasn't looking for that, but you know, that was a nugget that I found. So it, it, if you get started on this journey, you're going to discover a lot of things that are surprising, but that are, they help you fill in the gaps, but you don't know you're gonna find them. So oh, I think it's true. I think for me that, um, you know, I started with those two autobiographies, which were amazingly detailed. I mean, there's just, there was something about John White that so impressed Laura Haviland and Levi Coffin that they wrote very long, detailed passages about what happened. So that, you know, that gave me all the basics, but then, you know, it, it took a whole lot more research to, to find out everything about everybody afterwards and um, to fill in all the gaps. But, you know, um, during the pandemic, you know, just sitting there with ancestry and uh, I had, I could get every census record and um, stuff out of Canada, uh, Voice of the Fugitive newspaper, and then the Boston, um, I mean, the Boone County Public Library. I mean, I was back and forth with Hillary Delaney all the time. Every time one of us found something, we sent it to the other person and she had a lot of stuff. I could have, I could have gone on and on with more about the family, but I think Jacqueline Chambers Martin, the descendant, is going to present that sometime in the future. How did this end up in a New York newspaper with this kind of detail? That was that was a huge surprise. And then, you know, the other things were just um, some of the records out of Canada, uh, marriage records. And so, as I said, it was, you know, really, really good to have the help of or to work with Boone County. I just want to say we had another um, comment from one of the Cass Countyans who was on the line, um, wanted to mention the fact that there has been um, uh, an effort to re to re uh, what is it rehabilitate one of the homes in Cass County that was owned by James E. Bonine and Kathy Lapointe has spearheaded that, and I haven't seen it in several years, but I'm sure it's really beautiful now. And I did locate James E. Bonine's name as one of the witnesses who testified for the Cass County abolitionists. So I don't know if she knew that, but he did testify. And another shout out to the two, um to the Bonine House there in Cass County, just the really impressive collection of information that they have there. Um, if you're researching or if you're just interested, a, a great collection there. So ladies, um, what type of resources do you find are the best um, or, or possibly overlooked or what have you used the most when researching? And Carol, you just kind of touched on that, but I'm, <laughs> I'm curious to hear a little more from the both of you on that in particular. Well, nowadays, the best thing is to start with what other people have already written. So you don't have to go back to square one like we did and Vita and I and other researchers and go to the archives yourself until you are like tracking down a story to get 
you know, and you need all the original documents for it. Um, so I'd say first look at things that have already been written. Um, and then, you know, um, I, I think a lot of local histories, I mean, one of the other key pieces for this was there was a local history of a family member of the Watkins family who wrote her history of the account. So that, that I only, I found it in Manchester. So that would not have been found in any archive anywhere else. So it always pays to check out the local resources wherever you go to. Yeah, I agree. The Cass County Historical Library in Cassopolis was where I started. And like I said, the Niles Public Library had photocopies of Zachariah Shivert's account book. And for years, we thought that was all that was available until the, the I guess the family decided to sell um, the original. And we didn't know that was available until 2018. We also, and Amanda, you remember this, drove to Kentucky, to Lexington and Frankfurt. And in the libraries there, we found the Cassopolis outraged in the local newspapers, the Licking Valley Register. Uh, that was not lying back then. So, you know, you have to travel to those particular locations and look in the historical societies there and in the local newspapers, which at that time was on microfilm. Yes. <laughs> I know. I did a lot of that too. The whole signal of liberty I'm reading on microfilm. And now the whole thing is digitized. <laughs> yeah. The good old days. It does. Speaking, speaking of uh, Boone County, there's a shout out to Bridget Steiker, who's joining us tonight um, from Boone County. So thanks for joining us. So, you know, we've, um, there's a couple of things that really stood out to me tonight. Um, one was just the the people, one, the number of people, but number two, we, Frederick Douglass is talking about um, our Michigan folks, uh, Henry Bibb, um, Charles Osborne, and, and, you know, Charles Osborne um, over in Cass County, his, uh, his sons and grandsons were, were living there. And, you know, we, we see uh, Charles Osborne attending the World Anti-Slavery Conference in London in the, right. the 1830s, I believe, or 1840s. Um, these are big names. These are heavy hitters oh, right yeah. here um, tied in with these stories. And uh, uh, talk about a needle in a haystack, right? Um, uh, really interesting. And then the money. Um, you know, as Vita, I think you mentioned the, the fees or the fines um, that uh, uh, Quakers were, were trying to find recompense for and, and the fees that folks were paying and uh, um, the bonds. You know, it's $2,000 is, is still a lot today to a lot of folks. Um, you know, in 1847, to, to calculate out $2,000 um, today, that would be a, worth about $66,000. So this is not a... A, a venture where you can just, you know, phone a friend <laughs> and uh, <laughs> borrow a couple bucks. This is a huge, massive amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that our time is coming up, but I have one more question for you before we close out. Um, uh, maybe two. Uh, is there any, um, has there been any journey, any story that you've wanted to chase out, but it was too much? It was just too, you know, I, I look at tonight how we've, we've, we've done this, right? We've, you know, my heart was beating when you were talking about uh, Jane there and, and uh, I, you know, this, you know, people are getting beat up with stools and all kinds of stuff. Um, and, and we're talking about the very core values of, of human rights and of civil rights. Is there anything where you're just like, this is too much? This is, I, I can't, uh, I can't chase this one out. Oh, yeah, there's one in my book. I, I could never research it. it. It just, it makes me cry every time. So I'm, I would never do that one. But uh, you know, what happens is the opposite. I mean, doing this story, you know how John White assumed the name of Armstrong? Well, I try to track that down. And I think that is something worth, and what happens normally is when you do this research, it leads you to another story. So I think that Armstrong might be 
that a woman who escaped with her husband and child and went to Canada, then came back and got her five other children and brought them to Canada. And I mean, I think that's got to be the case. But there were there were several stories of these women escaping at the same time with their children. And, and um, like we have the two Carolines. And um, so, but this one is not, her name was Jane Armstrong. And so I really want to research that now, but I'm like, no, no, it's, it's not a Michigan story, really. Yeah, following names is um, an adventure in itself. Yeah. Uh, the idea that William Merriman was what the Quakers called this man. But when the uh, slavers, enslavers filed their affidavit, they put down the name Lewis. They were looking for Lewis. They had lost Lewis. And, and, and when Perry Sanford gave his version of the story, he said, William Casey, picked up the three-legged stool and fought the uh, raiders with it. So you have three names. And Debbie and Marty was able to find William Casey's obituary in, the, in a Detroit newspaper. And in the obituary, it said that he came from Cass County to Canada and he was there during this raid <laughs> and he had been injured and his name was William Casey. So when, when this man first came to, to Cass in 1847, he took an alias, William Merriman. And he's listed in Zachariah Sugar's account book as William Merriman with wife and children. Mm -hmm. The, the Kentuckians didn't know anything about Merriman, but someone on the witness stand got up and said, the person whose ear was bloody was Merriman, but the, but the Kentuckians called him Lewis. <laughs> so there it was in the testimony. Now, where did William Casey come from? Well, apparently when um, he was in Battle Creek after he left Cass, he used the name William Casey. And that's the name that Perry Sanford used in 1884 when he was interviewed. So there are three names <laughs> there. And that was, it took, me a, it took me years to solve that problem. But of course, with Debian's research. And then the other thing, that has puzzled us forever is why Zachariah Sugar used two letters, W and S, after the names of certain of the people who are listed as runaways. Last week, Debian offered the most um, plausible rationale for that, that perhaps some of the um, fugitives came from a Western route from the St. Louis, Illinois area, Milwaukee, and then some came from the South, from Indiana, Ohio. I mean, what I, we have been puzzling for years, what did the W and the S stand for? And that's the most, uh, sensible explanation hmm. but there are always mysteries there's still mysteries yeah uh, well um with that ladies uh, if anybody else has a, a a last minute question please feel free to um uh, type it in the chat here and um, just as I as I take us out of here for the evening and it's a, a huge appreciation to Dr. Rita Tucker and Mrs. Carol Mall for sharing their uh, their passionate work 
um, life's work uh, with us this evening. Um, appreciation to all the folks that have have joined in, um, and you will see an email in your uh, in your inbox uh, with a link to uh, per help us with feedback. Give us a, a message back and let us know uh, how you thought it went, what you enjoyed, um, what you didn't. We're we're always looking for um, new information, um, and we'll also include all the resources. So uh, we have the reference to uh, Debbie and Marty's work, um, and also uh, Kathy Lapointe has shared some information here in uh, in the chat on the um, Bonine House Research Library. So we'll include that in the link, and as well as um, other references that we talked about tonight. Um, we really thank you for joining us. Uh, we uh, hope that you continue to uh, celebrate Michigan's Underground Railroad Month. Join us next week for um, our final virtual pre presentation, and um, and even if you'd like to join us for our in-person um, uh, event on the 2nd. So um, thank you all very much and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.